Doug Smith is a senior policy analyst for the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition. Since joining in 2015, he's developed policies to reduce our Texas over-reliance on incarceration <coughs> and improve conditions of confinement and re-entry for people uh, leaving prison. Previously served as a policy analyst in the Texas House of Representatives Committee on Human Services, maybe you can talk about that, as well as a legislative director at, uh, for a member of the House. So politics is not a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I went to UVA and Larry Satanto was one of the instructors. And he would say, if you're going to do something in this country, you've got to be involved, right? So uh, Doug's very involved. Doug's passion for criminal justice reform stems from his own experience in the system, where he served six years in prison for crimes committed as a direct outcome of addiction. In addition to his state-level advocacy, Doug is a member of what's a long list, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Center, uh, Reentry Task Force, treasurer on the board of directors for the Austin Society Center, <laughs> assistant adjunct professor at UT Austin School of Social Work, where he teaches advanced policy. Uh, Doug graduated magna cum laude. We don't teach Latin here anymore, but I can tell you that's a really cool thing. Um, from St. Edward's in 94, and earned a Master's of Science in Social Work from UT Austin in 2000. Please give a big St. Edward's welcome. Yeah. I think like three quarters of the room are I mean, are related to our work with, but <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs> Who's here for extra credit? Does that one raise it? Okay. Thanks for choosing. I appreciate it. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for the or for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And it's so good, great to be back on the campus. I love this building. So uh, when I was here in 1994, it was much different. Fleck Hall was a different building back then, and we didn't have this incredible view. But I did realize that that uh, I could fight out an A in biology in this room. So I'm pretty proud. <laughs> Um, at that point, uh, I remember the Dallas Cowboys had their training camp here. I remember getting out of Holy Cross and walking over to Moody Hall and some kids running up to me to get my autograph. And, <laughs> and they looked me up and down and went, oh, darn. And they <laughs> yeah. um, but I do remember the Dallas Cowboys were in the gym as we were assembling for graduation. So we got congratulated at that point. I love St. Edwards. I was the third person in my family to go to college. My dad went in his 40s, and this is where he went and felt completely at home here. And it shouldn't be surprised because of St. Ed's commitment to first-time students. It just felt really at home here. And it's still opened up my eyes. One of the brothers who worked here, um, remember he had gone to march with Bishop Romero in El Salvador as he fatally protested the right-wing violent government there. And, you know, he taught me that the injustices occurring there fit within a historical context. And so, in talking about mass incarceration, it's really important to me, I feel really com committed to ensuring that whatever story I tell fits within a historical context. So are you all ready? Yes. So let's start. I'm going to just go ahead and take you all straight to prison. So in February 2009, I was crammed between the metal barred windows of a gray bus and a rather oversized gentleman to my left who was just trying to sleep, and we were handcuffed together. And we boarded the bus in, at the Travis County Correctional Complex. And I remember coming near the bus, and I saw that the maker of the bus was called Bluebird. And as you stepped onto the bus, there was a Disney-like caricature of a Bluebird. So my first step into prison was smashing a bluebird on the bus. And so we traveled east, excuse me, east, <laughs> past the Pine Curtain, and we arrived at the Huntsville, or excuse me, at the Holiday Unit. Whoever named it had no sense of irony. <laughs> so if you're ever traveling down I-45 in Huntsville, Texas, and look to your right, what you'll see is a long line of metal, what looks like storage units. 
dotted across the landscape, surrounded by empty basketball courts. So whoever designed the Huntsville unit, or excuse me, the Holiday unit, had zero imagination at all. And so we traveled along the barbed wire gate, and I remember the first image that I had, I looked up through the, through the barred window, and I was looking up at the guard tower, and I saw a, a woman there. She was in her 50s or early 60s. She was rather short, and she had a rifle over her shoulder. And I remember that the rifle hung down to her knees and scraped against her knees. She walked back and forth. It just wasn't an image that I was prepared for. I think I was expecting, I don't know, really just a fat white guy <laughs> with, that was balding and with mirrored sunglasses and a toothpick in his mouth and a shotgun slung over his, his shoulders. I hadn't seen a movie where the grandmother surveilled a courage <laughs> I think one thing that I realized as we were going through, because I had to, you got to sort of control your anxiety in prison, and I remember the first, the thing that I had to do was remind myself how lucky I was to be there, what a miracle it was that I was going there. Because like a lot of people in prison, it's a pretty rough road going there. So in the years prior, in the very short years prior to me going into the prison system that was preceded by three psychiatric hospitals, five ambulance rides, three ICUs, three rehabs, and three arrests. And I remember later, and I had to sort of remind myself of this later, that Nearly 80% of the people on that bus were either high, they were intoxicated, or they were mentally decompensated at the time of their arrest, or all three. So everyone on that bus was a miracle. So the building was created in the early 90s during the great Texas building boom. So the size of the prison system was already at about 48,000. It was burgeoning at that point. The tough on crime wave had hit Texas hard. And we had 48,000 people incarcerated. It was so overcrowded that the that county jails couldn't get people sentenced to prison over to the prison system because the prison system didn't have room. So the county jailers or the sheriffs themselves would drive them to Huntsville and handcuff them to the gate of the prison and drive away. And so that brought about a number of lawsuits. But it also brought about the great Texas building boom. And so our population grew from 48,000 to 157,000 in less than two decades. And it required us to build so many prisons that they dotted across the Texas landscape like like a gulag archipelago. Solzhenitsyn's name for his book on the Soviet police state. Governor Richards fashioned it as a jobs program. So I don't let anyone off the hook in this talk. When we talk about mass incarceration, I don't let anyone off the hook, Democrats, Republicans. But I think it's important to realize that in 1994, Ann Richards had some help. <clears throat> she, President Clinton signed into, help, uh, into law the Violent Crime Control Act, which was written by Senator Biden, which allocated $96 million billion to go toward building prisons and hiring police officers. Today, where we have crime rates about where they were in the 1960s, we have 80,000 police officers, and it takes six weeks to get into treatment for co-occurring psychiatric and mental and substance use services in the state. So 
So the holiday unit sits in a county with seven other units. And the total incarcerated population is 18,000 people, or 30% of that county's adult population. So can you imagine if you were running for office in that county, and one-third of the adult male voting age population couldn't vote for you, and you weren't technically representing them, even though they counted in your district? It is absolutely no coincidence that the era of mass incarceration, which began under Nixon, was began less than 10 years after the Voting Rights Act was signed. And so from 1960s, what we saw, let me take you back here to the 1920s. These were our incarceration rates. So they'd sometimes go up, they'd sometimes go down, depending on how harsh we were, how much we favored rehabilitation, how much we really just wanted harsh penalties. But these were our incarceration rates. Right? 1920s, 1960s, get into Nixon, and we start to climb. Get into Reagan, and we've got three strikes and sentencing commission. And then we get into the 90s, and we've got um, more harsh on crime, hard on crime penalties, and we've got the Violent Control, Crime Control Act, and here we are, the era of mass incarceration, and we've just dipped right here. We've dipped right here. That's the sum total of what the reform era has done for us. It's brought us from here to here. It's important to know, again, historical context, 1960s, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, 1968, riots, assassinations, 1970s, massive changes in political landscape, 1980s, 1990s, etc. So much money locked in. If you're looking for your answers to ending mass incarceration, Please don't look for it in ending private prisons or, um, or finding better rehabilitation programs inside of prison. You will find it in the massive amount of money that we put into this system and the amount of control that goes into constituencies because of that. So when I got off the bus, uh, me and the men were brought from the bus into the, into the storage facility, and we were stripped naked, handed some underwear, and we were put into cages, literal cages, and were closed sh shut. And we had to sit there for hours waiting for in-processing. So in-processing was intake, and we had to give away all of our property, and, and we got a haircut. We had to shower in front of the very, very unimpressed female clerks who stared at us. And we got out of the we got out of the intake facility, and they uh, handed me a lumpy, overused mattress and and all of my clothes, and I could walk out into the holiday unit. And I could finally see what it looks like on the inside, and it was two parallel rows of metal buildings separated by a long, quarter-long mile walkway that the incarcerated individuals, the men, not offenders, the men, the men, and officers alike called the bowling alley. No one accused us of not having a good sense of humor. <laughs> So, as I said, this was part of the prison building boom. So the building was built on the cheap, way on the cheap. So one of the lawsuits that came down during this burgeoning, uh, overcrowded prison system resulted in the prison system having to have to abide by certain standards like one man or woman and one cell, right, instead of three people per cell one person per cell. 
And so the prison system, knowing what a massive cost that would be and knowing what the legislature would be willing to allocate, they went to the legislature and they asked, can we have, can, do you think we could get just a compromise on this? Let's create these temporary holding units for people just for in-processing. And we'll call them temporary transfer facilities, which Huntsville unit, or excuse me, holiday unit us. And the very, very conservative legislature decided to liberally define temporary to mean two years. So men and women in other transfer facilities live in metal buildings with 104 other souls for up to two years. I stayed there for 18 months. So I looked around the, my new living area. So there were, for each building, there were, or for each housing unit, there was a picket in the center surrounded by four living areas, sections. And in those sections where I was, I walked in and I looked for my bunk, and all of the bunks are along the walls and there's no separation between, right? So everyone is in there. The sound is cacophonous. There are TVs up on the wall, and below the TVs are the showers and the toilets. So you can look at the TV and see the men uh, in the showers, and sometimes people got in trouble because they might have been looking in the showers when they should have been looking at the TV. <laughs> or that was what they were accused of doing. Um, but interestingly, the shower area was also directly across from the picket. And so the largely female workforce could look in on the showers and see men showering, having their biological functions, doing hygiene every single day. I was often perplexed by the number of women who worked in this male prison. And so I had to do a little digging, again, historical context. So the prison building boom occurred right near the same time that the Personal Responsibility Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, <coughs> also known as welfare reform, where people who are extremely low income with children were told they could no longer receive public benefits but had to go into low-wage jobs and put their very young children into childcare instead. I remember before the dissent happened, I worked at the Texas legislature, and we were working on welfare reform, and I remember visiting a welfare office, and I remember seeing a sign right near the clerk's desk saying, you will be a better parent to your child if you're not on welfare. That was what they were communicated to anyone who was very, very low income at that time. So in Huntsville, where the holiday unit is, the best place to find a low wage, low skill job is in the prison system. So it cannot be overstated how interconnected rural economies are with the prison system. So since mass incarceration has began, uh, began in the early 1970s, real wages have actually fallen for people in the lowest tier of the economy. economic mobility has reached to an absolute halt, meaning since the early 1970s, the likelihood that someone in the lowest tier of the economy will move to the next tier and on to the next tier is virtually zero. There is no change since 1970s. Yet, the cost of living has actually increased, rents, healthcare costs, etc. So, in rural communities, needing to work in a prison is an absolute, it's an absolute necessity. So both 
the people incarcerated in the prison, as well as the workers, actually have no choice to be there. So my time in Huntsville was really kind of marked by boredom. There were some exciting things that happened, you know. Um, I got on the wrong side of someone who represented the Aryan Brotherhood. That was a really bad day. Um, there, were, there were fights. There were chess games. I had to stay in the cell, or in the block, a lot because I had such an extensive mental health history. It was so extensive, in fact, that when the person in the sociological interview interviewed me, she looked at me and she said, oh wow, you had that. Which I wasn't sure whether to be proud of that or... <laughs> but I was shocked because I don't think I'd ever heard that, particularly from someone who interviews thousands of people who also have substance use disorder and mental health issues. So in that block, I couldn't work. They did not allow people who had mental health issues to be able to work. That was something that happened later, but not then. In fact, in the prison system, people with mental illness were deprived multiple opportunities, like the opportunity to become a trustee trustee is the highest time earning status, and it looks really good to parole to have to be a trustee working outside the prison. Yet, if you have a mental health diagnosis, they don't allow, or excuse me, if you're taking psychotropic meds, you cannot become a trustee. At one point later in my prison journey, I actually went off of the psychiatric meds, which was a nightmare, in order to become a trustee, in order to, in increase my chances of parole in order to get home to my daughter while she was still a kid and not a teenager. So in the Huntsville unit, what I did with my time along with 104 other men was to read. I read the three-part series on the Civil War. I loved history by Shelby Foote. Um, we had a book club. I read the, the um, Dante's Inferno. Um, and I actually read it three times. The person I read it with first was a gentleman, a very older gentleman, who um, I will not say what he did, and it's not really important. What I will say is that he was there, and he had studied in, in Florence, Italy, and knew Dante's Inferno backwards and forwards, knew um, that it was a book of revenge upon the people who had exiled him, and it was juicy. <laughs> if you know what he's talking about, I'm like, oh, this is a great book. And, um, and another young person who had, an who had an educational attainment level of eighth grade, which is the exact educational attainment level of people in Texas prison system, saw us having such a robust discussion, he said, I want to read that too. And they said, that's great, would you like to borrow my book? He said, no, can you read it with me? And so for every night for 34 days, we read a canto and we discussed every single night. God, I would love to know what he's doing now. And then another person saw me do that and said, hey, can you do that with me too? And so that's what I had to do with my time. I also sweat a lot. The Texas prison system is largely unair conditioned. So let's think about that for a second. In that in Dante's corner of southeast Texas, where the hunt the holiday unit lies, the temperatures can climb well into the triple digits, with the inferno-like sun right up against the metal buildings, elevating the temperatures inside of those 
units up to above 120 degrees, literally cooking people alive. The prison system, in its efforts to mitigate the heat, would load trash cans filled with ice and water and wheel them to the dorms or the living areas or whatever you want to call them, and we'd all line up, 104 of us, to go and dip our cups in in order to have a cup of cold water. But by the time it had reached us, it was already lukewarm because the holiday unit doesn't actually produce enough ice to do, to do that. So they were going through the motions in order to avoid a lawsuit. Currently, the Texas prison system is experiencing a number of lawsuits and already uh, one unit for more aged populations actually has to air condition the unit. And what I've heard so far is that the air condition is breaking down and the prison system isn't fixing it fast enough. <coughs> the other thing I tried to do there was to sleep. And remember men talking to each other from one end of the living area to the other all night long. And there was nothing you could really do about that because just like men do, and sometimes women do, when you're living in a context where you know, opportunity is not really available to you, one of the things you naturally do is affiliate. And that happens in prison too. And one of the things you don't do is to tell someone who's affiliated to please shut up. <laughs> And I saw a lot of activities like that. I saw people breaking into lockers of their, uh, of their bunk mate and stealing all their food. And you couldn't say a word. You couldn't say anything about that. <coughs> the thing is, like, no one said a word. But no one also said a word when <coughs> we as a nation committed ourselves to building a carceral state. No one said a word. The Republicans were in on it. The Democrats were in on it. Any flutter of activity that's happened to roll this back has only happened recently. No one said a word in creating this. And the result of that is we have two million, nearly 2 million people incarcerated. We have 5 million people on probation and parole. We've got millions cycling in and out of juvenile detention, one half million into immigrant detention every single year, and millions in county jails. No one said a thing when average length of sentence went from the single digits into the decades. Or when we, as a nation, named a public health crisis public enemy number one and began to lock up black and brown men for possessing drugs. No one said a thing when one's ability to pay actually determined whether or not you were going to be released from county jail when you were still innocent of a crime and just needing to defend yourself. Or when we started to lock up 17-year-olds as adults in adult prisons. Or when we started to station police officers in public schools instead of having restorative justice programs. So, and the reason is reason is all of us. So, because the entire experiment is based on a simple idea that the harsher we are with someone, the less likely they are in the future to commit a criminal act. It's based on that classical criminological theory that prison serves as a deterrent. It's a theory that has been long ago debunked, and yet we are thoroughly committed to it. In fact, it's in our DNA. Holiday unit is a physical manifestation of this classical theory and the lowest view of human worth. So, according to classical theory, classical theory, people who affiliate with gangs are thugs who deserve solitary confinement. That extremely low-income people who accept public benefits are freeloaders who deserve to have someone else raise their kids. That people who use drugs are criminals. That kids 
who commit crimes are adults. What we have here, as they say in Cool Hand Luke, is a complete and total lack of imagination. So, and I will tell you that I'm in on it. Remember that story I told you about the book clubs that I did? Because I used to love to tell this story about how I embraced this experience of rehabilitation. I walked into prison and I said yes to book clubs. I said yes to Bible studies. I said yes to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I spent, said yes to meditation. I was saying yes to just whatever was available to me. Um, I said yes to a criminology class was actually pretty cool. I'm glad I said yes to that. <laughs> if you ever want to take criminology, take it with people who are in prison currently. That's where you ought to take criminology. It's fascinating. And I used to say that to myself, and I would say uh, to members of the legislature, I would try to sort of make myself credible. Yes, I was in prison, and here's what I did with my time, and look at how I'm doing right now, and look at this solid ground that I'm on, and that gives me credibility to tell you why you should end mass incarceration. And the truth is that I didn't get out of, come on solid ground. Very few people get out on solid ground. What you get out of in prison is a $100 check, the clothes on your backs, a month's supply of medication. That's what you get. And you enter into a workforce that is most likely not going to hire you. You get, in, that might be changing, particularly among nonprofits, but for for-profit for business, not so much. There is not a property managed community in this entire city that will allow me to turn, submit an application there. The only way I can find a place to live is if I own a house or if I can find an owner of uh, a house and live in their garage apartment, which was where I lived for quite some time. Now my wife and I own a house. And I love, I want to put a fine out there, like, you can't do a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the story that I told, and so I'm kind of in on it, right? I'm continuing to steal dignity, I'm continuing to send a message that prison could somehow be a springboard for someone, so therefore, if Doug made it, it must have been a sign of his resilience, and if someone else re relapses or recidivates and returns to prison, it must have been because they are thoroughly committed to a criminal lifestyle. It must be that. So the lesson that I learned is that prison did nothing. What happened to me is I found a safe, supportive, and loving community. I found a job that was meaningful and paid me a decent salary. I found a place to live, and please listen to me on this. I got health insurance so that I could be the captain of my own mental health and substance use care. That's how you help someone recover. Prison has zero to do with that. So the problem is that we're still addicted to prison. It's our go-to option. So our minds rebel against this idea that we would live in a world without prisons, that we would live in a world without police officers on, uh, at our beck and call, that there's 80,000 of them. Right? Our minds rebel at it. In fact, when I'm saying this right now, I'll bet you a lot of you are thinking right now, well, what if? What if it was, uh, what if it was something that happened to my daughter? What if it were my brother? What if it were my mom? What if I for a survivor crime, like everyone's, now everyone's doing it, right? <laughs> We're addicted to this way of thinking that prison and police are always our answers. But we don't ask the first question. And the first question is, what if we are truly interested in resolving the issues that give rise to criminal activity in the first place? What if we as a community were interested in what if we were interested in doing something about illicit drug use and didn't have police officers, courts, prosecutors, prisons, jails, or any of it, probation or electronic monitor available to us? What if we were really interested in it? The one thing that I'm not going to do tonight is actually tell you what that should look like. 
right? Because that responsibility is not actually with me. That responsibility is with you, right? Because that's the argument that we always get into. Okay, well, tell me what we're going to do about this if we don't have cops and, and prison. And I'm going to turn it right back on you and say, yes, what do we do about that if we were truly interested in and what I will tell you what will happen is that that will fire your imagination. So I'll give you an example. During the last legislative session, uh, the members of the legislature came in and they said, we need to do something about package theft because we're tired of our constituents telling us that our Amazon packages are being swiped off our front doorstep at Christmas time. So we need to do something about package theft. And universally the response, Republican Democrat was, hey, we'll make it a felony. We'll have a harsher sentence. So we'd rather send someone to the Huntsville unit for stealing a $20 package of breath spray. It's actually what I get from time to time. I get $20 packages of breath spray. It's really good. Uh, today I have gum. Anyway. Um, they were willing to put someone in prison for that. Do you know what the compromise was? Okay, well, we'll just put them in jail for a year. That was the compromise, and that passed. Because they didn't ask, what if we were truly interested as a community in actually preventing people stealing our packages off our front of doorsteps, which we get reimbursed, by the way, right? Which we get reimbursed. Well, what would we do? We don't have cops to deal with, deal with this. <coughs> Well, if we're forced to really think about it, I don't know, maybe we could ask Congress to allow for all mailboxes to be refitted for any common carrier. Maybe Amazon could create uh, coded lock boxes for, a, for apartment complex or even for your front driveway. Like, those are just two, and I'm not going to take all responsibility for creating all of these solutions for you, right? This is time to refire our imaginations and, and ask ourselves, what if we were truly interested in dealing with these issues that give rise to crime, like homelessness, like mental health, issue, mental health mediated by substance use disorder? So as a reformer, as a social worker, as a St. Ed's grad, I made a choice to committing myself to imagining a new possibility. And that starts with asking that question, what would I do about this problem if prisons weren't available to me? And you know, what happened when I made that commitment was it restored my dignity. And all of the people in the, in the holiday unit who are sitting there right now sweating. Thank you very much. So before he takes Q&A, and I really hope to say that students especially ask, because it's an alum, so we know where you're sitting. Um, I'm passing around the sheets if you need to sign in for any reason, not mark your name or write in your name and your instructor. We have lots of food, so you can get up and get back down if you want. When we're all done, I'm going to ask you to take the food. Right? I mean, you're students, you got to be hungry at some point. You gotta eat. Um, we have flyers for all our events here, and the thing under your seat now, because some of you displaced it, maybe you're sitting on it, the blue form, which is the feedback form, tells us what you think of this talk, and if you write anything bad, I'm just going to cross it off anyway. And then, if you want other programs like this, or a different one you want to hear, let us know. But if you've got questions, you heard a very compelling story about firing your imagination, and not just doing things the same old way because they were done that way. Ask away, and, and I'll let you on the floor because I'm sure you're used to having uh, this. Anybody questions? Absolutely. Can I say one thing about <coughs> evaluations? Look, I'm constantly trying to improve my public presentation, and so I really do appreciate feedback. So this is this was great or this was awful isn't really helpful to me. So I appreciate <laughs> any feedback you have. Any other back and forth about the public presentation itself? Right. Yes. I don't think we have a category. So go ahead. Any questions, please. <laughs> 
Yes. Well, I have two questions. Okay. okay. You said the offenders instead, I mean, men instead of offenders. I'm an ex-parole officer, and yes. we call them all offenders. Right. So why would you call them just men versus offenders? Because my name is, is Doug Smith. Yeah, it's not offender. Like, I don't need to be categorized, right? I, um, I, sometimes we use the term formerly incarcerated person, right, if we need to sort of categorize. But um, my parole officer calls me Mr. Smith. <laughs> so was your record expunged? Oh, no. Yeah, I would sooner grow wings than have my record expunged. Yes. Yes. So I think I'm right about this, but like FBI records used to show that like crime was numbers were way higher in the past. Mm -hmm. and you were talking about how incarceration rates are like were even until the 70s, the 80s. Mm -hmm. So like what happened was like the incarceration rates being high, is that like were we bad at punishing crime? Was it like we didn't care? Is it easier to spot crime? Like are these some of the things like was it just simple? They just the people making laws didn't care. Was it a culture thing? Like that's what? a wonderful question. Yeah, this is actually my stepson Dylan. He was asking. Yeah. So what's the if I get it right? So what uh, if um, if incarceration rates were staying pretty constant and crime rates were sort of relative to one another? Then. Um, what accounts for such a dramatic difference in the incarceration rates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll take you back along my graph here, and I want to remind you two-thirds of the individuals in the Texas prison system are black or Latinx. Two-thirds. 34% of the people in Texas prisons are black. 33% are Latinx, 31% are white. So the majority is black, even though they're 12% of the Texas population. And if you follow this graph, I would ask you what are the forms of social control that were available to society prior to the rise of mass incarceration. Jim Crow laws could restrict people's rights to vote. Lynching. There were a number of ways in which uh, justice and control could be meted out. What the sea change in the 1960s was the right to vote and the end of the end of Jim Crow, the ability to get housing and, God forbid, to live in suburban housing. This is the cultural context where, and the historic context where mass incarceration was born. Right? It was a new form of social control. To understand it, apart from that, steals the dignity of, in, of the primarily black and brown people who are impacted by it. Okay. Is that up? Yeah. I'm going to come a little bit closer. Um, what are your current felonies? Oh, yes. Okay, so um, you were incarcerated after you had graduated from college, from university. Yes. And do you think that your re-entry process was smoother because of your education? Absolutely. No, absolutely. I got uh, my, um, my re-entry process. You know, I used to tell the woes of my reentry process in order to sort of um, hold solidarity with other people going through reentry. Um, but the truth is, I had a mom who allowed me to stay in her upstairs in her upstairs bedroom. I uh, I had a master's degree. I had connections with the community. It did take me five months to find a job. The first job I found was in a, a warehouse sorting used smartphones for nine dollars an hour. And I actually loved the dog job. I was really good at that. I could do like a thousand in, in like eight hours. It's really good. Um, but I found this job because I had connections with the community. I was friends with 
the now executive director of, of Austin Recovery, who connected me with this organization. I wrote writing samples because I had, had taken the capstone course here at St. Edwards, and I was a good writer, like St. Edwards students. And that was what opened up that door for me. The vast majority of people getting out of prisons do not come anywhere close to having that level of connection, uh, privilege, or educational attainment. Yes? Um, so you talked about agricultural economies uh, and rural economies being tied into the prison system. Yes. How does the like prisoner lease system sort of tie into that in the opposite direction? Yeah, thank you for asking me about that. That was actually a historic, that was um, one of the forms of, of control of black lives was the lease system. So um, black men could be, mostly black men could be arrested for any number of reasons, like vagrancy, like not having a job, or basically unemployment, and they could be placed into the Texas prison system where they were leased out to private landowners, private companies, and forced to work as slave laborers for those companies. Right? This, is, um, this is one of the shameful marks on our history. Right? Um, Right now, currently, Texas people in Texas prisons uh, do work for free. They are they get nothing for their labor. In fact, they don't even get time uh, off of their sentence for that free work. And so, I myself finally did get a job working as a clerk in a metal in a um, mechanical shop. Right, and and I got up at five in the morning and I worked till. The early afternoon, and that's what I did every day for free. There are people of color right who will go out tomorrow uh, with hoes to go work cotton fields tomorrow, mostly black and brown. They will do that, and they will do that for free. Yes? Um, I heard you refer to yourself as a performance, so is there a reason that you? Ah, I did say that, didn't I? I'm an abolitionist. <laughs> it's important because this is one of the, this is part of this, we're trying to figure this out. Remember I told you that mass incarceration is only just dip, and it took enormous effort to get from here to here. Enormous effort, right? And so in Texas they had to do some changes to how we consider people for parole. Um, through our organization, we were able to raise the property offense penalty thresholds up to one of the highest in the country. Through all of these sets of reforms, we were able to close eight prisons, eight out of 112 prisons. We were able to close eight prisons, absolutely. And so through that era, we um, called ourselves reformers, right? And I think a lot of us are realizing that that's not giving uh, respect to the people primarily impacted by mass incarceration. And so I'm glad that you caught me on that because I'm in this mode of letting go of reformer and imagining a future where we don't have a carceral state, right? That we handle the issues that give rise to crime through some other means, something that that upholds the inherent dignity and worth of people. So thank you for calling me on that. <laughs> yes, in the back. Yes. Um, so like you mentioned, like um, I'm going to come closer to you. Uh, being like an abolitionist, um, when it comes towards like policy to get things moving in that direction, do you find that you have to do a lot of compromising to try and get that to? So I'll tell you a story about compromise. I um, compromises. I mean, so we can call it compromise uh, if we truly honor diversity. What we do is we honor dissent, and if we're truly listening to what people who are impacted say, um, and when they s raise objections to a particular policy course. It's in, 
we absolutely have to listen to that. We have to take that in, and we have to uh, we have to enter into negotiation, right? Because there's other choices in which we could do that. We could create a system of consensus only, right? Who has all the power in a consensus only decision making process? I'm an instructor, so I have to do this. Who has all the power in consensus only? What's that? The person who disagrees. They have all of the power. Right? Um, or you could just do it on compromise, right? Like, we can only please 60% of, of us, and so the 60% are going to go forward, and we're just going to go ahead and alienate the rest. Or we can actually engage in conflict, dialogue, honoring dissent. What we do as um, in this community who deeply cares about ending mass incarceration is oftentimes we haven't really connected with communities most impacted in the way that we should. Right? And so that's where compromise becomes a really, really ugly word in that it's people not impacted compromising when impacted people aren't in the room. Right? And so that's the thing. That if this is a lecture on ethics and leadership, then that would probably be the, the most important question asked tonight, is what is our ethical duty in moving forward with changing any policy? And that means centering the voices of those most impacted. Thank you for asking that question. Maybe one more question, the time is short, but he's going to stay around after, and if you're a reporter or, or a student, especially if a student, you can still go up and ask. And I think there was a question in the center. Ma'am, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did, yes. Yes. Um, you know, the, 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 the changes in policies and what have you, uh, as far as uh, incarceration laws and criminal laws, they seldom, if ever, are made retroactive. So therefore, it doesn't do any good for the ones that have already been given those life sentences, you know, and the 3G sentences. And, and so from your perspective, when you're as an analyst and a, a, a lobbyist and all the different hats that you wear, yes. do you ever see a, a push for that? And it just doesn't come to pass, but we never see it on the outside. You know? A push for retroactivity? Exactly. Well, uh, so at this point in Texas, I don't think that we've done anything so um, transformative that we would need to think about retroactivity. Oh, right. That might, the, big, the big exception to that would be the property offense penalty thresholds, because prior to that, if you, um, if you were arrested for stealing $1,500 worth of stuff, that would have been a felony. Today, it's $2,500 worth of stuff, yeah. right? But we haven't done the really, really heavy lifting of addressing things like the fact that we have a 35% parole rate, the, the fact that we have people and living in prison in their 80s, yeah, yeah. right? We haven't done that hard work. And so when we do, then we're going to have also the hard task of making that retroactive, right? So one thing that I'll give you a one glimmer of hope is that there's bipartisan consensus around something called second look, where people who were convicted uh, for crimes they committed as youth and certified as adults. So the second look would act would basically give shorter, uh, a shorter period uh, for, before you get to parole review, right? And that would be applicable to people who are currently incarcerated and convicted if that went through. And there's bipartisan, um, there's bipartisan agreement around it. There's not. It's not universal, so, but hopefully next session that will happen. Let's thank Doug, our our help helper, Elmo.